to say a big thank you to the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network for inviting me again to do a webinar about uh, anal cancer and colorectal cancer. So I just want to start the webinar off by stating I am not a doctor, I am not a nurse. Um, I used to be a medical professional. I worked in cellular pathology in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, so I do have a fair amount of medical background but I'm not working in the medical field now. So this webinar is really a presentation from my patient perspective and also as the perspective from the perspective of someone who hosts and helps manage um, forums for peer-to-peer -peer patient support, predominantly for anal cancer, but I also do a lot with the colorectal people as well. And a big shout out to the Colorectal Cancer Association of Canada, who provided some of the information that's gonna be on these webinar slides and with whom I do a fair amount of volunteer work. And also they have excellent information on their website about anal cancer. Uh, I'm not being sponsored or paid by anyone uh, to present this webinar. So I have no conflicts of interest for anything I will be talking about today. So what we are gonna be talking about today is just an overview on who the Colorectal Cancer Association of Canada and Anal Cancer of BUMRAP, who we are, understanding colorectal and anal cancer from the symptoms, the risk factors and incidences of these cancers uh, within Canada, treatment options for those kind of cancers, and then prevention techniques, or you know, we can do our best to try to do our best so as not to get them per se, screening, lifestyle options, and then I'm going to talk about the benefit of peer-to-peer -peer support groups, be that online forums, be that by email, be that by telephone, because there really is something amazing about being mentored by someone who truly has walked the pathway that you are either walking or have walked, and they too have walked that pathway. So the Colorectal Cancer Association of Canada, for who they are, a national nonprofit organization comprised of volunteers, board of directors, and counseled by an expert medical advisory board who are absolutely perfect, dedicated to the improvement in the quality of lives of patients. So the Colorectal Cancer Association of Canada, based in Montreal, fantastic organization. There are many fabulous organizations worldwide. So now that it's so easy to reach the world at our fingertips, by the internet, there are many, many phenomenal groups out there with uh, phenomenal information and phenomenal help. And in the same way, there's a lot of groups out there with a load of nonsense and uh, dramatism, and you need to be selective as to where you're reading information, especially when it comes to anal cancer. The mandate for the Colorectal Cancer Association is to promote awareness and education of colorectal cancer. They'll do, as I say, we do have anal cancer information on there providing support for patients and their caregivers, and the advocacy for primary prevention, screening, equal and timely access to effective medications, etc. Anal Cancer of BUMRAP is a non-profit organization comprised of volunteers. We're based in Canada. We provide international support. So um, we promote international awareness and education of anal cancer. We provide support for patients and their caregivers. And again, we're advocating for primary prevention, screening, and equal timely access to effective medications to improve patient outcomes. So now it's a case of understanding colorectal and anal cancers, the similarities and the differences. And as I say, I am not a medical professional, so I am not going to go into the deep and scientific depths of colorectal and or can anal cancer pathology. Uh, even though I could, I'm not going to. So what's in this section? What is colorectal and anal cancer? What are the stages of each of those kinds of cancers? What are the symptoms? What are the risk factors? And what are the numbers in Canada of each of those things? So what is the difference between colorectal and anal cancer is most of typical question. So as most of you know, the colon and the rectum is part of the large intestine and it's approximately six feet in length. And its main job is to reabsorb water from digestive content and serve as a holding chamber for stools until evacuation in the rectum. The anus is the opening at the end of the large intestine through which stool, poop, whatever you wish to call it, solid waste exits the body. And it includes the anal canal, which is approximately four centimeters in length 
and the anus. The anus is, if you were to be so brave as to look at your rear end in a mirror, what you're seeing is your anus. Inside of that is the anal canal, about four centimeters. And then above the anal canal is the rectum. So that's the sort of you know, basic anatomy of what is going on there. The colorectal cancers are cancers that affect either the colon or the rectum. So the colon, ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid colon, and down into the rectum. It's also known as cancer of the large intestine or the large bowel. And then most colorectal cancers start in the cells that line the inside of the colon of the rectum. Typically, it is a slow growing cancer and if caught early enough, has an excellent prognosis. An advanced colorectal cancer is when the cancer has grown through the entire colon or rectum wall and into nearby tissues or organs. So what's anal cancer then? So anal cancer is the cancer that affects the area that marks the transition between the rectum and the anal canal, the anal canal, or the anus itself. And in just in so much as there are different colorectal cancers with the most predominant colorectal cancer being called adenocarcinoma, in the anal cancer world, there are several cancers here as well. The most predominant is squamous cell carcinoma, we also have adenocarcinoma of the anus. We also have melanoma of the anus, lymphoma, sarcoma, neuroendocrine cancers. There's a whole variety because the anal corridor itself is the most interesting and little complex organ of the body. And it's just stunningly interesting to see, you know, what can uh, happen in that actual area. So as you can see from the diagram on the slide that you're looking at, we're given the basic overview of basically the upper part is the rectum where your poop is all stored as a reservoir. Then at the bottom, you've got the anal canal and that little wiggly line, which I'm calling it's um, just above the internal sphincter. So that's called the dentate line. And that's where the differential between the anal canal and the rectum starts. And that little area is full of all these different cells, squamous adeno, melanocytes. You can get a whole variety of cancers from there. And then in the anal canal, it's typically lined with squamous epithelium, which is why you're gonna get the squamous cell carcinomas from there. And at the anus and in the anal canal, you also have glands, anal glands that are secreting, you know, producing and providing mucus. And those are adeno cells, epithelial cells. So you can get an adenocarcinoma from the anal canal and the anal glands, which will act differently from an adenocarcinoma that you're going to get in the rectum or the colon. So again, as with colorectal, if we can catch them early, then it's much better to be diagnosed in the early stages than it is with the later stages. Staging of colorectal cancer is slightly different from staging of anal cancer. And we're not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this slide, but it's just to say for colorectal, it talks about stage one, two, three, four. So stage one, no lymph nodes affected, and it's only grown through a few wall layers, if you will. Um, stage two, it's grown into the muscle layer. So I'll let all of you Google the actual makeup of the large intestine. It's the most wondrously interesting organ. Stage three, it's grown through the entire wall and started affecting some nearby lymph nodes. And stage four, is where not only has it grown through all the wall affected lymph nodes, but it's metastasized into nearby tissues and or distant organs. So when I'm talking about distant organs, I'm talking about things like the liver, the lungs, the spine, the brain, you name it. We all know typically what stage four means when it uh, comes to met metastasis of cancer. The stages of anal cancer, they do it slightly differently. And since this slide, we now have a stage three C. Uh, so they're changing the grading system. So stage zero is carcinoma in situ. Um, you'd be really lucky if you're caught at that stage, that would be great. And the cells are found in the innermost lining of the anus. Um, these abnormal cells may become cancer cells and spread into nearby normal tissue. And things like an anal pap test or, which is the same as cervical pap test will detect this. We'll talk about that later. Stage one is cancer is formed. So the, can, the cells have changed, they become cancerous. They've already grown through 
the basement membrane of the anal canal. So this is when we're talking about those wall layers, we're sort of talking about this kind of thing. And again, you guys can Google the anatomy of that and understand. Stage one means the tumor is less than two centimeters. Stage two is a tumor is larger than two centimeters. And we now have a stage between two and five centimeters and over five centimeters. Stage 3A, tumor can be any size and it's gone into the nearby lymph nodes or nearby organs, such as the vagina, urethra or the bladder. Stage 3B, again, tumor any size, gone into some nearby lymph nodes or it's gone into lymph nodes that are a little bit further along and it may also spread into the vagina, the urethra, the bladder. Stage four is any size tumor. It may have spread to lymph nodes or nearby organs, but it's also spread to more distant organs or tissues. So again, the anal cancer can metastasize, loves the liver, loves the lungs, loves the spine when it does metastasize. So those are the stages. So as with any cancer, um, earlier detection is a better prognosis, which is why, you know, screening is important and going to the doctor. And I just want to say that March is colorectal anal cancer awareness month. Once upon a time, March was purely colon cancer awareness. Then it moved to colorectal cancer awareness. And now we decided to be all grown up and call it colorectal anal cancer awareness because one of the biggest issues we have with anal cancer is the problem that people have even mentioning the word. If no one's willing to say the word anus or anal, then the people who are feeling stigmatized by having anal cancer and embarrassed and humiliated are going to be further embarrassed and humiliated because we can't find it on the internet. And uh, so if, if the good organizations don't have anal cancer tabs, then they're actually adding to the problem of stigma. So every organization who's dealing with large intestinal carcinomas or any GI tract carcinoma should also have an anal cancer tab so that people can read up on bona fide information. So symptoms of colorectal and anal cancer. Now the symptoms of ultra low rectal and anal cancer have a lot of overlap. The actual colon cancers that are further up not so much so. So I'm going to be talking particularly about symptoms which are more rectal and anal. So bear in mind that these symptoms may not be present in the early stages. And when they do appear, it will vary depending on the cancer size and location. And the biggest thing to know is the most common misdiagnosis in anal and some rectal cancers is the patient and or the primary care physician, GP, thinking that the cancer is just hemorrhoids. And one of our biggest taglines is when, a hem when is a hemorrhoid not a hemorrhoid and when it's anal cancer. So we're very cognizant of the fact that we do need to get a lot of awareness out there for these kind of symptoms and also a recognized identification proper identification. So the symptoms we're going to talk about, uh, you know, constipation, abdominal cramps, bloody stools, unexplained weight loss, etc. I'm going to go through each of them individually, but not spend a lot of time on them just because I want to really drive home to you guys that any and all of these symptoms are something that you should be going to your family physician about and not not feeling embarrassed about going to your family physician about it. Now, I'm married to a family physician. And I will tell you now, in the same way when I was working in cellular pathology and I worked with all my stunningly vocational healthcare providers and my family physician husband, we worked in those lines of work because we were vocationally working. We wanted to provide for the good of the whole rather than the good of the self. And our main aim of the game was to try and help you have as long and as ill-free life as we possibly could help you achieve. We're not embarrassed looking in your mouth. We're not embarrassed looking in your bottom. We're not embarrassed looking in your vagina. We're not embarrassed looking at your toe. We're not embarrassed looking at your hand. It's you guys who have the embarrassment problem, not us. So please, 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 we're here to help you. Please do not let embarrassment be one of the main delays in you seeking help advice and treatment because we don't want you to be dying of embarrassment because that's what's going to happen to you if you allow embarrassment to 
prevent you from seeing your doctor. So when we go through these symptoms of the colorectal and anal cancers, constipation is a big one. So constipation can happen for many, many reasons, but one of the reasons that we're mainly talking about as far as colorectal and anal cancers are concerned is the fact that the actual tumor itself is blocking the passage of feces through your intestine. So if your tumor is either in the colon or it's in the anus, especially in the anal canal, then that's going to cause constipation or it may even cause total blockage. And so usually a total blockage does not happen overnight. This has been ongoing and you know that you've been having some problems and you've put it off and you've been embarrassed and you've not seen the doctor. And then by the time it's too late and you're totally blocked, then, you know, that can be a huge problem. And you're very late stage cancer at that stage as a rule. Abdominal cramps. We all know there's loads of th reasons for abdominal cramps, whether it's the Indian you ate last night or the beer you ate with the drank with the Indian. However, abdominal cramps that are happening more often than not, and you don't know what on earth is going on. Don't keep it to yourself. Go see your family physician. Your family physician wants to be able to help you. They also want to find out what on earth is going on. Bloody stools. Now, obviously, bleeding when you have a poop is not the ideal scenario. We all know that many, many of us do bleed a bit when you go to the toilet, usually because you're a bit constipated or you didn't go to the toilet when your body told you you need to go to the toilet. You've got a bit of straining going on. And you've got that bright red blood, which just comes up on the tissue paper a little tiny bit. It's the bleeding, which is, mm, you know, any bleeding you should be wary of and at least try and tell a family physician about it. But when you're having bleeding, which is of a concern to you. So I'm talking it dripping out of your bottom. I'm talking about, God forbid, it running down your leg. I'm talking, God forbid, of, you know, your feces, which not only has bright red blood covering it, but it's all inside the feces. Now, I'm going to start talking about really basic things now, which a lot of you are going to go, what? You're really talking about that? You know what? If you're not looking at your poo, how are you going to know when it's abnormal? Tell me that. You're not going to know. So I want all of you to know that one of the first screening techniques of colorectal cancer is in your own bathroom, in your own toilet, and on your own tissue paper. And there is nothing wrong with having a look at the tissue paper when you've wiped your bottom, so you can get an idea of what's normal and what's not. So if your poo is a nice brownie brown color, then life is good. But if your poo is going into strange colorations, blacky, tarry looking color, uh, you can obviously see there's blood in it or something, or it's coming out a really weird shape. If you're used to having poos, which are the kind of poops we see in all the cartoons and we know what they're supposed to be shaped like, then all of a sudden you start pooping this strange ribbony shape, then you know why you're pooping a strange ribbony shape, because something's pressing against the poop to make it a weird ribbony shape. So I want to be cognizant of that and, I, and just really start being self-aware. Self-aware saves many, many people in this world. And, you know, you go to your family physician. And my family physician husband, you know, we were talking about this yesterday when because someone on the forums was talking about the amount of blood they're losing. And, and it's really hard sometimes to know what they actually meant. How much is a lot of blood? How much is a little? Take a photograph. Why not? What have you got to lose? And you have everything to gain. So please start getting over your embarrassment of doing things like that. Unexplained weight loss. Obviously, anyone with unexplained weight loss is uh, you've got something going on go to the doctor, loss of appetite. If you've got a tumor merrily blocking your intestine and your body realizes that something's going on, it's gonna start being wary in itself subconsciously, even though you know you may not even be aware of anything. Nausea and vomiting. Worst case scenario with an intestinal blockage is you start vomiting it back up, where else is it gonna go? The tumor's blocking everything. Gas and bloating. Side effect and symptom of many cancers, especially the gynecological ones and especially the colorectals. So please, ladies, please don't be shunned off with I've got IBS or, you know, it's your age, it's menopause or any of those things. Please go to your family physician. And I don't care if you're not menopausal, if you're 30 years old, if you're 22 years old and you're having color, you know, gas and bloating, go to your family physician. Fatigue. 
If your body is subconsciously trying to battle cancer of its own accord, it's going to make you feel tired because your body is trying its best to fight off what's going on. Itching is a cause of or a symptom of many things, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, uh, tumor, AIN. Talk about AIN in a minute. Um, so there's also um, a, a well, it's not a syndrome, but there's actually anus perini, whatever it's called. So itching anus. So people have that without anything pathological going on. It's well, it is pathological because you itch all the time, but it's something that's there. And you know, if you've got this itching and it's not going away, then you know what, guys, please get it checked out because this is your potential life on the line here. Feel a lump. Obviously, feel a lump. A lot of people are going to be listening to this webinar and say, not only is she telling us to look in the toilet, look on our toilet paper, take a picture of what I'm looking at and take it to the doctor. She's also asking me to feel my own ass. Of course, I'm asking you to feel it. How do you know what's normal? How do you know what's not normal? The amount of people, even on my anal cancer forums, what do you mean, Helen, look in the mirror? I don't want to look in the mirror. Why would I do such a thing? Why would you do such a thing? To help save your life is why you would do such a thing. Really, people, really, get over it. You just have to start just being self-aware. There's nothing wrong with doing this. Self-aware. Now, risk factors of colorectal cancer. Nothing in here is new, everybody. Just want you to know that. Working in cellular pathology 30 years ago, we all knew about, you know, what the risks were. So age is a risk. The older you are, you have a higher risk of many things. What I want you to be wary of is over the last few years, we are seeing a massive spike in ultralorectal cancers, especially in the under 40s. So in actuality, age is not, you know, please don't wait to go see the doctor with a lump because you think you're too young. Please don't wait because you think you're only 20 odd and nothing can be going on because rest assured, there are people with colorectal cancers in their 20s and their 30s and their early 40s. And so I want you always to be cognizant. The patient's history of polyps, cancer, or inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory bowel syndrome. Syndrome is different from inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease are going to be the most typical ones. It's going to be Crohn's disease. It's going to be ulcerative colitis. We know that chronic, chronic, chronic irritation, inflammation over time, there's going to be a day when the cells give up the ghost and go, you know what? I've just been dealing with this inflammation too long now and they start going a bit awry. So inflammatory bowel disease is a marker. Polyps, obviously, most people only find out they've got polyps when they're having their, you know, routine colonoscopy screening over the age of 50 here in Canada. Um, not every polyp causes cancer, but nearly every polyp can, never nearly every cancer, adenocarcinomas come from polyp. Family history of colorectal cancer. Now, takes a long time for colorectal cancer to grow as a rule. So I'm just gonna do these caveats as, as a rule. Obviously there's always exceptions to some cancers. Some are more aggressive than others, but usually it takes a long time. But if you've had a direct relative, mother, father, brother, sister, even the further, further ones, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, I'd still look at, if you knew that they died of a colorectal cancer, an adenocarcinoma, then in reality, what should be happening to you is you are starting your screening programs 10 years prior to their diagnosis. When they were diagnosed, if they were diagnosed at stage one, phenomenally lucky them, and they may not have had it that long. If they're diagnosed at stage three or stage four, typically they've had it quite a while. So, you know, they've had it a couple of years, they've not known about it. So that's why we want you to be screened 10 years prior to their diagnosis. So we can catch you early. That's the biggest thing. Genetic syndromes. There are several genetic syndromes which give a predilection to the colorectal cancers. So Lynch syndrome, which is given another name in Canada, and family adenomatous polypi or FAP. And then racial ethnic background. There are some races and ethnicities that are more prone to colorectal cancers than others. And then there's the lifestyle related risk factors. And we all know that we've all been preaching for 50 odd years now 
exercise and good food and fiber and you name it, et cetera. The risk factors of anal cancer are different, slightly different. So the following several, several factors may increase the risk of developing the most common type of anal cancer, which is squamous cell carcinoma. But some people get cancers without any of these risk factors, exactly the same as the colorectal crew. You know what? You may not have had a single risk factor and you develop it. So this is why going to the doctor is important. Age. Now, if you look on statistics for the average age of what is deemed a squamous cell carcinoma, you'll find that the average age is supposed to be about 60. The youngest person I have on my forums right now is 34 years of age. The average is around 42 to 44 years of age. These are, these are female heterosexual HIV negative women, mainly in monogamous relationships. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Frequent anal redness, swelling and soreness, inflammatory bowel disease. So we've already talked about this. Ulcerative colitis is in the colon. Crohn's disease, however, is everywhere in the intest general intestinal tract from your mouth to your anus. And the, uh, you know, Crohn's disease can sometimes have a beautiful predilection for being in the anal canal. So you've got that chronic, chronic inflammation, fissures, abscesses, you name it. Having anal fistulas, which are abnormal openings, this is where you get a little hole, if you will, coming from either your low rectum or the anal canal, and it comes out somewhere else. So it can come out in the vagina, it can come out on the buttocks, it can come out on the, the area between the male scrotum and the anus, the female vagina and the anus, there's all these things. So again, what's going on there? We've got something wacko going on with the cells. We've also got inflammation and soreness going on. So that's one of those things. Another thing for anal carcinoma, and this is really aimed at the human papilloma virus type of anal cancer, which is almost predominantly the squamous cell carcinoma type, is people who are living with lowered immunity for whatever reason that lowered immunity may be. So they're living with HIV. They are organ transplant recipients, so they're automatically on anti-rejection medication to lower their immunity so their body doesn't fight itself. They are on immunosuppressive drugs for a variety of other reasons, autoimmune diseases. The inflammatory bowel diseases are on immunosuppressive drugs. So what happens is they're just less likely to be able to fight off an infection as and when they get one. Human papillomavirus infection. So the most common anal carcinoma is squamous cell carcinoma. 85% of anal squamous cell carcinomas are going to be human papillomavirus related. Having multiple sexual partners. This always makes me have a bit of a giggle because really what's the difference between having sex 10 times one week with one person with gonorrhea and having sex 10 times one, in one week with 10 different people and one has gonorrhea. So you just have, you know, all it does is it's opening up, literally, figuratively, opening up your risk. So if you have sex with 10 people, then you know what? Maybe one of them has HPV. Maybe one of them has gonorrhea. Maybe one has syphilis. Maybe one has chlamydia. One maybe, you know, so the more people you have sex with, the more risk you're at. So that's just always added. Having receptive anal intercourse. Now, it is now proven, and I will say that word again, proven that you do not need to have anal intercourse to get anal cancer and the reason that i'm reiterating this so strongly is because the highest risk of anal cancer patients we are now seeing are female heterosexual hiv negative ladies who have been in long-term relationships who've not had anal sex but a lot of them have a history of prior cervical dysplasia in their 20s. So there's a correlation here between a history of cervical ab abnormal PAPs and anal cancer. Now, cervical abnormality, 99.9% .9 of cervical abnormal PAPs are caused by human papilloma virus, 99.9%. Now, if everyone who had cervical dysplasia got anal cancer or any of the other human papilloma virus cancers in the genitoanal tract, the globe would have died off by now. 
So obviously not everyone is going to get anal cancer if they've had cervical dysplasia in the past or cervical carcinoma in the past. It's a risk factor. So they need to be screened and seen. And smoking cigarettes, well, <laughs> smoking cigarettes is tagged to absolutely every single cancer. So, well, you know, and it always has been. So some people may not have any risk factors at all and still develop anal cancer. And the squamous cell carcinomas is significantly rising, like I said, amongst the heterosexual HIV negative women. The other anal cancers, adenocarcinoma, melanoma, et cetera, not a strong correlation with human papillomavirus infection. I think the jury is still out on a lot of that as to what's going on. So, Colorectal cancer in Canada. Now, in 2017, we had 26,800 cases of colorectal cancer. It affects men and women almost equally. Screening rates are low despite provincial screening programs. Why is that? Because you're all at home worrying like sick because you've got blood in your poop, you've got a sore bum. You're thinking, what the hell's going on? My hemorrhoids aren't going away. I keep buying this preparation H, whatever it is, and it's not going. And I don't see my doctor because I'm so humiliated and I'm so embarrassed and I don't want someone to look at my bum and all the rest of it. Well, hello. Hello out there. Please. I've already gone over this. The medical field is here to help you. They're not embarrassed. Just not. So please go do it. Anal cancer in Canada. A class is a rare disease. So rare diseases are those uh, cancers where there's less than 1,000 or less than 5,000 people on a continent with it. Uh, approximately 1,000 cases in Canada in 2015. Anal cancer numbers are high amongst the men having sex with men and HIV positive populations, specifically the squamous cell carcinomas and H, as I've said before, 80, 85, 90% associated with HPV. However, reiterate again, we're seeing this squamous cell carcinoma massively increasing in the heterosexual HIV negative population, especially for women typically over 40. Why do men having sex with men have more of a risk of anal cancer? I think it's, you know, we have the HIV. So if you're HIV positive, it's that. And then we also have irritation and inflammation. So, you know, Everyone needs to be looked at. And, uh, you know, if your clients or if your patients in your clinic are male homosexual men, you'll be amazed how many men don't tell you they're homosexual. So unless you're screening them and they tell you, you won't know. So we just I just want equal care for absolutely everyone, regardless of sexual orientation or gender or whatever. Treatment options of you know, these kind of cancers. So we're going to touch on this vaguely. Your medical professionals, if God forbid you are diagnosed with colorectal and or anal carcinoma, your medical team are your best friends. They have to be. And uh, you've got to trust them. You've got to like them. Uh, I'm not going to say oncologists always have the best bedside manner, but that's a new point because really you're after their academics and their brains. Their nursing staff are going to be the ones who hold your hand and things like that, and your own support network. So always talk to your doctor about understanding the risks and benefits of any treatment whatsoever. And I'm going to go over this generally. So surgery. Surgery remains the primary treatment for colorectal cancers, and it may be an option for anal cancer. So in the very early stages, surgeries can involve removing a polyp, or in the case of anal cancer, a small lesion, providing surgery is not going to negatively impact the oh so vital anal sphincters. There are two sets of anal sphincters, external and internal. Your external anal sphincter is the one that you use when you're at work and you suddenly realize you're gonna pass gas or you need to go to the washroom to do a poop and you squeeze your bottom uh, and try and waddle off to the toilet as fast as possible. That is your external sphincter and it is under your conscious control. Your internal sphincter is not under your internal control, subconscious control. The internal sphincter is always firmly closed because this is the gateway. This is the one that holds that poop in the rectum. And so if you damage that internal sphincter through surgery, 
or if a tumor is growing on it, uh, then it affects the sphincter control of the anal canal. And that's when we start seeing the incontinency issues. So in advanced surgeries, such as colectomy, a section of the colon and all the rectum can be removed. If they think that, you know, large tumors, they think they can cut away a section of your colon and all the rectum, and then they'll either give you a temporary colostomy, temporary ileostomy, and then six months later, or however long your medical team wishes for you to wait to heal, to get your own strength back, then they're gonna attach that bit of intestine back to the anus that was left inside you. And that's called a reversal of a reversal surgery. And you can poop as normal through your anus. Um, some, sometimes for ultra low rectal and maybe some of the, especially some of the anal carcinomas, that is not possible. So they have to remove the entire rectum and the anus. And at that point of the game, you will be having a permanent stoma, permanent colostomy, most probably permanent ileostomy rarely, but, you know, permanent colostomy. And as I've mentioned, if possible, remaining parts of colon and rectum are reconnected to create a functioning colon or a stoma. For some women, especially with uh, some of the more advanced or the larger rectal or anal tumors, then not only do they have to have their anus and rectum removed, they also have parts of the vagina removed. And uh, this is a huge surgery. It's a huge surgery for anyone. An APR, abdominal peritoneal resection, big surgery for anyone. Uh, with consequences, hopefully for a long life, but definitely with consequences for, you know, your life after that. Then we come to the chemotherapy and radiation. So we all have a vague idea as to how chemotherapy and radiation works. None of us need to be five times over PhD scientists knowing exactly the molecular workings of the chemotherapy and all the radiation that we are taking, okay? So never think that you have to become Einstein reincarnate and know exactly what's going on. But in broad forms, chemotherapy stops the growth of cancer cells, either by destroying them or stopping them from dividing. And it can also be used to reduce the size of metastases. The drugs are administered via the bloodstream usually, or they can be administered orally, depending on the chemotherapy that you're going to be on. And then radiation therapy, what that does is it damages the genetic material within the cancer cells, thereby limiting ability to divide. Normal cells are also affected by radiation, but they're able to repair themselves in a way that cancer cells can't as a rule. So as you can gather from that, chemotherapy and radiation, A, the aim of the game is to affect your cancer cells, it's also affecting your other cells in your body. So chemotherapy is everywhere in your body. So that's why you see people whose hair's falling out, sore mouth, all of these GI issues that they're on because the chemotherapy is loving to seek out really fast replicating cells. And the fastest replicating cells are in the GI tract and your hair follicles and things like that. The radiation therapy is gonna be way more targeted. And the better radiation machines have come over the years, thank God, the more targeted this radiation therapy can be. And there are various forms of radiation therapy. There's now the new proton therapies, et cetera. Your medical team are gonna be talking to you about that because when you get a cancer diagnosis, you're gonna be working with a surgeon. You're gonna, most probably, you're gonna be working with a radiation oncologist. You're gonna be working with a medical oncologist. And they know lots and lots of things in this day and age with the fast turnover of stunning new technologies and drugs that are being found sometimes it's really hard to be on top of it all but you know what you've got google and there are a thousand sites out there who are doing brilliant jobs at uh, you know putting into layman's terms what new drugs and protocols are out there and peer support forums with people who are already on clinical trials who are seeking clinical trials who are finding out what all these are they're going to explain these things to you Biologics talking of clinical trials. So this is where the biologic therapy targets part of cancer cells that's making them different from normal cells without harming normal cells. So usually they're a man-made version of an immune system protein fitting like a lock and key. Now, I don't wanna lose any of you in the be all and end alls of immunotherapies because this can be overwhelming. And I'll tell you now, if you're working with or the caregiver to, a cancer patient, 
the new cancer patients, when we're told we have cancer, even the most intellectual ones of us lose our ability to fully logically think, analyze, and be able to deal with all the information that we're being thrown at, okay? So be easy on us. Be easy on yourselves. Stress makes people not compute as well as usual. So try and make things as simple as possible and don't get overwhelmed. Your medical team, as long as they know what they're doing, then that's good. But these immunotherapies are like a man-made version of an immune system protein. Fits like a lock and key with a particular protein and they lock onto cells or proteins and stops that activity, which helps stop cancer cells from growing and dividing. And there's, there is so much new meds and immunotherapies coming out. It's overwhelming. It's, it's brilliant. It's exciting. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, when I was working in cellular pathology in the 80s, we stood on the shoulders of giants and we were talking about hypothetical HPV vaccines. We talked about hypothetical immunotherapies. We talked about, we talked about all these things. The decades have gone on and the scientists of today stands on the shoulders of the giants that maybe my peers were. Everyone stands on the shoulders of giants, thank God, and everyone is learning from the past to make our future so much better. And it's just a phenomenal time. We're still far from the be all and end all cures, but we're getting there. And I think that's the important thing. So these personalized medicine, and we're going to hear more and more about personalized medicine. You know what? There's going to be a day when we always talk about breast cancer or prostate cancer, or colorectal cancer, pancreas cancer, all of these cancers. But you know what? We're working on the molecular level now. We're not talking at organ level. We're talking molecular. And some of those molecular issues are throughout a whole variety of different kinds of organ cancers which is why some of these biological therapies are, act, are helping people with lung cancer and they're helping pe the people with colorectal and they're helping people with pancreas and they're helping people with a whole variety of things. So it's exciting, it's phenomenal and, and it's just, we're living in an amazing time. So these personalized medicines identify genetic differences in individuals that affect the way people respond to the drugs. And this is through identifying biomarkers, which are biological molecules found in blood, body fluids, tissue, or the tumor itself. And most excitingly for us in Ottawa, Canada, we have phenomenal research institutes at our two hospitals, both at CHEO, which is the children's hospital, and at the Ottawa hospital. And we are doing cutting edge cancer research here for many, many cancers, including anal cancer and colorectal, here carried out in Ottawa, Canadian research, global impact, absolutely phenomenal. And what well, I actually run a cancer research fundraiser and I actually grant fund viral oncolytic research with doctors John Bell and Dave Stoidel at CHEO and the Oral Hospital. So, you know, phenomenal things, people, are happening. So, but as I say, if you're the caregiver, if you're the cancer patient, you know what? You've enough to go on to get on with. You don't need to be Einstein reincarnate, as I've said. Don't start to think you need to know the ins and outs and everything of everything, okay? It's good to know vaguely. If you've got a friend who's a really good project manager or scientific slant, get them to do the research for you. Not you. As the cancer patient, you're looking after yourself. You're plodding through your treatments. You're healing. You're resting. You're eating well. You're keeping hydrated. Taking your pain meds. You're doing all those things. Your caregivers helping you to help you do that. So assign work like investigating things to other friends who got a really good slant. Now then, chemotherapy, the side effects of chemotherapy, as we know, hair loss, or the whole gamut of things, whole. There's also huge side effects of radiation, pelvic radiation. Lots of people have pelvic radiation. It's not just for renal cancer. So you have pelvic radiation for rectal cancer. You have pelvic radiation for a lot of the gynecological cancers, there's a whole gamut. So there are side effects. The radiation therapy is highly effective in the treatment of anal cancers. And thank God, as I mentioned before, huge improvements in radiotherapy techniques and machines, but uh, it can affect tissues and other organs in the pelvic region. So sexual function is a huge issue, vaginal stenosis, erectile dysfunction, 
anal stenosis, bladder issue, joint pains, rectal anal bleeding, and loss of fertility in women. All of these things need reviewing and talking about because we're getting more and more people surviving long term now after their cancer diagnosis, but we're living long term with side effects of the treatment. And it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to ask about it and it's okay to want to know about it. How are we going to prevent colorectal anal cancer? You know what, guys? We're not always going to be able to prevent it because sometimes it happens and we don't know what's going on. So there are things we can do. So let's see what we can do. We've got screening. We've got healthy lifestyle. We've got the human papillomavirus vaccination. And then we've got patient support, which helps you in an emotional state. Colorectal cancer screening, as we know, average age is over 50. You'll have started doing your fecal blood testing, which is gonna be replaced by the fecal immunohistochemical test in the fall of this year. Once every two years, you'll send that off and that's detecting blood in your poop. So again, look at your poo in the toilet, look at your tissue paper, look and see what's going on. Colorectal cancer screening, high-risk persons. High-risk people are those people whose immediate family have had a history of colorectal cancer. First degree relatives as a rule, parent, child, or sibling. And really 10 years before they were diagnosed is when you should start being screened. And you need to, you know, your doctor needs to know your family history. So it's really important to know that. Anal cancer screening, we've no national guidelines for the general population. It's too expensive to have a general population screening. And so for now, anal cancer screening is carried out in our high risk populations, our HIV positive population, our immune suppressed populations as a result of medications, as a result of organ transplant and or being on immune suppression meds for diseases that you have, inflammatory bowel disease, any of the other of the auto, you know, body issues that are going on, past anal cancers. Screening includes the most simplest and the cheapest digital anal rectal exam. You know what? Let your doctor do a digital anal rectal exam on you. They're going to put the glove on. They're going to put loads and loads of lube on their finger. They're going to put the finger up into your anus. It's not going to hurt. And they're going to feel around. And if you've got a tumor there, ultra low rectal or anal, you know what? They're going to feel it. So let them do it. High resolution anoscopy, colonoscopy. Next screening, anal pap and HPV testing, human papillomavirus testing, becoming more and more in the news. The human papillomavirus nine valent vaccine is a cancer vaccine. It is not just for anal cancer or cervical cancer. It's for head and neck. It's for a variety of HPV related cancers. So please don't see it as a sexual thing. Please see it as a cancer vaccine. Precancerous anal neoplasia, if it's seen, if it can be diagnosed and seen, it can be treated. Anal neoplasia is similar to cervical neoplasia. That's why all these, all you women have been going through cervical caps forever. It's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, HPV related. Anal is anal intraepithelial neoplasia, typically HPV related. Follows the same staging. Treatment is similar, more complicated for the anus, but it's doable. Not every family physician is, will have a clue as to what to do here, but that's okay because he, he or that he or she can refer you to someone else who may know. If you're already being treated for gentle warts, for instance, and you know gentle warts, then you're already being looked after someone. So that's good. Preventing colorectal anal cancers, healthy lifestyle tips. And as I keep reiterating, please be aware that some, sometimes people get cancer for zero, zero reasons. Don't start blaming yourselves. You know, it's it's just, this ridiculousness of being shamed into thinking I didn't exercise enough or I was too fat or I was too whatever. You know what? Try your best, but don't blame yourself. If every pediatrician blamed the parents for every child that's brought into a pediatric hospital because the child's broken its leg, climbing out, falling out of a tree, do you think every pediatrician turns around to the parents and says you're a total idiot for letting your child climb a tree? Of course they don't. We don't blame. We don't blame. We're here to help you maintain a healthy weight, engage in your other exercise, diet, more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean protein, healthy fats and fiber, and limit alcohol and maybe red meat, especially processed meat consumption. Stop smoking if you can. And always talk to your doctor about these things. You know what? Your family physicians have got some really great guidelines to help you in those. The benefits of peer-to-peer -peer support for colorectal anal cancer patients, as I mentioned before, 
Uh, you know, I always make the metaphor of, I, you know, of all the brilliant midwives out there, and there are brilliant midwives, and there are brilliant midwives who haven't had a child. And I think for all those brilliant midwives who've never had a child, they're brilliant. But when they have a child, they suddenly begin to think, holy goodness, this is what I thought I knew. Okay. There's nothing like having the real thing, alas and alack. And that's the same for any cancer patients. So being able to have support from peers who have walked the journey you are about to walk or walk it with you who are at the same stage as you is absolutely very special and highly important, especially for rare and stigmatized cancers such as anal cancers. Because first of all, you're gonna feel when you're first diagnosed, everyone, it happens to everybody, embarrassment, humiliation, who the hell am I gonna to talk to? I dare even tell my family I've got anal cancer. I'm gonna tell them I've got rectal cancer. It's totally okay. Tell them you got rectal cancer. It's okay, just tell them. Don't stress yourself out by making yourself have to say these things. But even so, the reason it's all stigmatized, we're not talking about it, is because, you know, nobody mentions the word anal or anus. Everyone associates anal with anal sex. So I'll tell you something important. The anal corridor is four centimeters long. The average erect penis is 13.12 centimeters. You know what you're doing? You're having rectal sex. Rectal sex. But no, no one thinks of that, do they? No, no, anal sex. Everyone thinks everyone with anal cancer has been having anal sex. I don't think they think everyone with rectal cancer has been having rectal sex. Anyway, so advice and support for your medical teams. There are many international support organizations to give you emotional support, advice, information on clinical trials. And there are specific anal cancer support organizations as well. And you can contact me for more information on those. There are many international ones and they are absolutely brilliant. Testimonials here, we're not gonna talk about why do people seek peer support? Because it's helpful. But you know what? Some people don't seek peer support in the first year of the cancer diagnosis and that's totally fine. You do what's best for you. More peer support. So March is colorectal and anal cancer awareness month. 21st of March is anal cancer awareness day. You know why we have to do that? Because we tried so hard to get people to mention the word anus or anal. So we spread it all over the world and, we, and it's working. We're getting people, more people to talk about it and see this poster on this web, I've just changed it now. Now we've got colorectal anal, March is colorectal anal cancer awareness month. What are you sitting on? I want you to talk about it. I want you to break the silence. I want you to lose the stigma. And if more of us talk about colorectal anal, we're helping lose the stigma because we're breaking a silence and we're talking about it. And the aim of the game is to save lives. That is why we are talking about it. And that is why we need to talk about it and get it out there. So that comes to the end of my webinar. I want to thank you so very, very much for listening to me. And does anyone have any questions whatsoever? Just a reminder to everyone, if you do have a question, you can type it into the box on your right. We'll wait just a minute here in case any of you do want to put in some questions. We have a minute or two to address anyone. I'm just gonna say hi to Margaret, who I know is listening. She's on one of my forums. Hi. Okay, we have no questions coming through here. If any do come through, uh, we will direct, uh, we will direct them to Helen after the webinar as well. Um, if any questions happen uh, that you just don't think of right now, you think of later, please address them either directly to Helen or to us at info at survivornet.ca.